Isaac Saracen is a skilled hacker, formerly employed by British Telecom Sprint. When his health failed, Isaac did the only thing he could think of. He ran. He found a haven in a working-class district of the city known as Little Russia. There Isaac took on a new name, Ishmael. He then became embroiled in the affairs of a brutal member of the Lamediza organized crime family, known as Leo. Convinced by his longtime friend Frankie to flee from his commitments to the Lamediza family, Isaac found himself hunted by the ruthless Leo. On a rooftop, far from witnesses, Leo murdered Frankie. Only through the use of his skills as a hacker was Isaac able to drive Leo off. Wounded, alone, and far from help, Isaac depended on the kindness of strangers. One stranger, a burqa-wearing doctor known as Fatima, took pity on Isaac and helped him make his way to the mysterious Star X Line. At the end of all hope, they found the Star X Line and the slim promise that the enigmatic beings behind the Star X could save Isaac from the implants which destroyed his life. What do you do when those who saved you have recorded everything you are? What do you do when your every action is tracked by the keylogger? ColbyJack.net is proud to present Firmware Keylogger, the third installment in the Firmware Pentology by Colby Tracks. Zero one dash zero zero dash one zero Ishmael For the first time in my life I saw who Fatima was. Not the shape he was born as, but as the person she really was. I was on a bench before the Grand Mosque. Behind me a fountain danced, around me in dress ranging from ultra conservative to ultra modern, past supplicants on their way to Isha prayers. I felt the hum of the city lesson as everyone stopped what they were doing as the voices of a thousand muzins rang out in unison across the still night air. The Adan carried in the evening air with a level of clarity impossible anywhere else but in this counterfeit city. I had been waiting for days on a bench before the Grand Mosque, watching the penitent as they made their way first to Fajr minutes before dawn, and then Zur at noon, Azur in the afternoon, Maghrib after sunset, and now Isha in the darkness of the night before midnight. A parade of fashion not normally seen on the streets of the city passed by me all day long. No one even gave me a second look as I sat in a pair of khaki chinos and a long-sleeved t-shirt watching them. No one, that is, until Fatima found me. It was moments before the Kwama, the call of the faithful within the mosque to line up for prayers, when she called my name. Well, not my name, but the name of my progenitor, which to her at that moment was the same thing. Isaac? A middle-aged woman with laughing eyes and a broad smile wearing an orange headscarf, brown designer leather jacket, dark orange and gold flex shawl, and pink abstract flower dress in the Jakarta fashion called to me. What are you doing here? I looked at her, feeling something familiar in the woman's gaze, but not knowing who she was. A window opened in my vision off to the side, like a notice in a video game. By talking to me directly, the woman had given me access to her public ID. I scanned it quickly. The name Fatima jumped out at me. What confused me the most was her oval face and dark hair showing from within the frame of her orange headscarf. I had never seen Fatima's face before, and like a chick imprinting on the first face it sees, I knew this was to be Fatima's true face in my memory forever. It's Ishmael, I said. My voice in my ears sounded flat and unmodulated. Oh! Fatima said, her face looking concerned. Is your rig malfunctioning? You don't look right. There's nothing wrong with my rig, I said, trying to add some natural modulation to my voice and sounding more like a robot than before. I just thought, Fatima said as the call of the faithful to line up, the Aquama rolled across the city. She glanced toward the doors of the Grand Mosque, where the last of the supplicants were making their way into the company of the faithful. I raised my hand clumsily and motioned for her to go inside. It was a good attempt for someone suffering from a degenerative muscle disease. Go, go, 
I will wait here for you. Are you sure? She asked, her doctor's eyes seeing the palsied motion of my hand, her doctor's face looking worried. I'll be fine. Go and do your duty. I'll wait. I motioned again toward the gates of the mosque. I'll be back soon, Fatima said. I knew my strange motions bothered her, but the look in her eyes said that me being alive was more important than my ability to control my muscles. She ran across the square and into the mosque. I thought I caught her glancing back at me before she disappeared inside. In another place, in another time, and if the Fatima I saw here was the real Fatima, I would like to think we could have made a lovely couple. From what I remembered of Fatima from before, in the back room of the Amazov catfish farms, the man known as Fatima was a male tomboy. He liked dressing up in women's clothing, and he also liked women. Though his sect, the Abedini, believed the intellect was more important than the physical, and the love of one to another could only be measured by the standards of the heart and not by the arrangement of the genitals, he had suffered persecution for his conduct. Come to think of it, I was no longer a man. I was a former man who had stripped himself of his own body image in order to make his bandwidth needs less. I wasn't the only one who had deleted my sense of self, my proprioception, the intimate understanding of where each element of a body was at every moment of its life. My brothers Samuel, Simeon, and Samuel had done the same thing. Though, now thinking back on how much bandwidth losing my proprioception had gained me, I was starting to believe I should have kept it. Especially now that I was attempting to navigate a simulation of the city filled full of human beings all attempting to live, if only for an hour a day, in a city which did not fear them. Don't get me wrong. The city has been, all religions are equal in the eyes of the law, since the signing of the city charter. And at the prefecture level, that is true. It's at the human scale where things don't work so well. On the streets of the city, when one mentions the word Muslim, the average Jane will immediately comment on the horrible conditions for women in the Indonesian Caliphate, as well as the treatment of women in the Kingdom of Saad and the corporal punishment practice in the Islamic Republic of Turkey. There is a fear, left over from events of several centuries past, which suggests Muslims desire one thing, the overthrow of the proper, God-given city charter, and the institution of Sharia law. At that point, one will be reminded that nearly a quarter of the current city police is made up of the descendants of good Catholics whose only flaw was to be born Catholic in Indonesia. It seemed like every mention of Islam brought out a memory of an atrocity from a generation, a century, a millennium before. For a people with no history, the denizens of the city sure remembered a lot about a group most weren't even aware of ever meeting. In a city where less than one in eight of us attend a place of worship at least once a week, the adherents of the Muslim faiths make up 60% of the regular practitioners. And of those, the members of the Abedini sect make up nearly 80% of the observant Muslims. 21 million citizens of the city were observant Abedini, roughly 6% of the population, and almost no one knew they existed. The reason the Abedini passed nearly unnoticed was because of their virtual community systems. These virtual community systems were the direct result of their beliefs, which in turn strengthened these beliefs by giving them a feeling of community in a place which was outwardly hostile to them. Even in neighborhoods which claimed to accept everyone, if a person revealed they were Abedini, their closest friends would say their Abedini friend was one of the rare good Muslims in the world today. Never once did these well-intentioned souls grasp the inherent insult to Islam contained within their statements of support for their Abedini friends. The Abedini were well aware of the subsumed hatred toward Islam and the Prophet and kept their society beneath the city's social radar. They were hiding in plain sight, enjoying a level of community found in no other society in the history of mankind with no one being aware they existed. Their community was underpinned by the V-Mosque environment. The V-Mosque was a spin-off of the V-Hajj environment, which allowed the Abedini to go on Hajj. Generations before, the Abedini sect as a whole were banned from the Arab Peninsula, Mecca, and Medina as kafir, or infidels, and thus could not participate in the Hajj, one of the five pillars of their Islamic faith. The V-Hajj was needed to allow the Abedini a chance to fulfill their religious duties. 
But that wasn't the reason they built it. No, the reason they built a virtual Hajj and then a virtual mosque was because the Abidini believed one day a new prophet would emerge. A prophet who would not be born of fallible flesh, but who instead would spring from the mind of man, a being of pure thought existing somewhere between man and the angels who would bring the latest edition of Allah's agenda to them. This being of pure thought, what was it? According to their own beliefs, that being would be an AI. An AI which would convert to their faith, fulfill the five pillars of their faith, and bring them the newest truth. In the meantime, they would use the fruits of their preparations to bring their community closer together. Though, when I first heard of the V-Mosque from Faran back at the Amazov catfish farm, I pictured something a lot simpler than a virtual city dotted with mosques dedicated to the different ways the faithful wish to represent themselves. In the neighborhood in which I now sat, with its grand mosque dominating over a square complete with fountains, mosaics, trees, and flower boxes, things were not that different from the city I knew. I knew, however, that a mile to the north was a neighborhood of light, where beings of pure intellect attended to their soul's needs. I also knew that a mile to the south, there was a neighborhood where everything looked as it had in the days of the prophet, in an idealized Mecca of myth. There were neighborhoods for every taste and understanding stretching all around us, each one infinite in its scale while bounded neatly on all sides by other believers' neighborhoods that could be reached in less than ten minutes of walking, flying, swimming, or whatever form of motivation was used within the realm. I hadn't visited any of the neighborhoods besides this one, but had been made aware of the infinite variation of forms one could maintain within the virtual community of the Abedini. It was truly breathtaking, and made me wonder how many of the individuals I would meet within the shared world of the Abedini rarely left its confines. I could picture a terminally ill woman deciding to live out her last weeks of life in a world where the pain of life was forever banished behind a wall of nerve blocks and high-grade painkillers. Later I learned that hiding from life in the V-City was not only frowned upon, but was grounds for loss of V-City privileges. A terminal believer could visit but they couldn't live their last days cut off from the real world. That was not acceptable. That was right. When I searched for the V-Mosque, I had been pointed to V-City. It was through the V-City account servers I learned just how far the Abedini had come in their preparation for the coming of their AI prophet. The initial account creation page contained options for millions of different variations of avatars to represent the user while they were inside the V-City. Everything from the mundane, as I was currently logged in as, to the fantastic was available. There were options for the standard fantasy races of centuries of popular fiction, as well as traditional favorites as Jinn, Angels, and Ifrit. There were also options for beings of Platonic, Euclidean, and non-Euclidean forms. As many varieties of forms as there were grains of sand upon the beach. I guessed where to start when I thought about where Fatima would be found. I assumed that in his perfect world, he would be a person who could wear the hijab without needing a burqa to hide his obvious male attributes. In short, Fatima would be a real girl. Firmware Keylogger is the third book in the firmware pentology. That's five books, if you must know. It begins where firmware proxy ends, which in turn followed on the heels of firmware hijack. So you haven't heard or read firmware hijacked or proxy, this would be a great time to head on over to colbyjack.net and either download the podcast on the audio side, read the episodes on the visual side, or download the Colby Jack Sunday Reader issues 1 through 46 in your choice of either EPUB or Mobi. Firmware hijacked Proxy, and Keylogger are all available in ebook versions from our store at shop.colbyjack.net, amazon.com, barnesandnoble.com, and smashwords.com. Just search for Colby Tracks. That's C O L B Y T R A X. I'm the only one. A complete audiobook version of both firmware, hijacked, proxy, and soon Keylogger is available for download through our shop as well. If you don't need any stuff, 
who would like to support our work, drop on by colbyjack.net and hit the pretty little donate button conveniently located on the right-hand side of the blog roll. If you're on a smaller screen, the bottom will be found at the bottom of the page. Firmware Keylogger is released under a Creative Commons, non-commercial, attribution, share-alike license. Do what you want with it. Just don't sell it and always tell people where it came from. If you receive this from a friend and want more information about ColbyJack.net and our split personality website, just drop on over to ColbyJack.net and select either the audio or visual side. The audio side carries our podcast while the visual side carries our writings. Whichever side catches your fancy is fine with us. We're of two minds about the whole thing anyway. I do mostly Twitter, so if you do the tweets and want to follow me, I'm Colby Tracks. That's C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X. Thank you once again. Remember to be fabulous and have a wonderful week.